to trends in management of metacarpal fractures. These are learning objectives. We'll review the relevant anatomy and classification of metacarpal fractures, discuss the indications for conservative versus operative management, and explore the current trends in the management of the fractures and complications. This is just the outline of the talk. Um, I did want to kind of define the scope of this presentation. Uh, we'll be talking about adult metacarpal fractures uh, of the head, neck, and shaft, mostly of the neck and shaft, and we're going to exclude the metacarpal base fractures and CMC dislocations for another time. We'll talk briefly about thumb uh, metacarpal shaft fractures, but not about the base fractures, the named base fractures. We'll go over some cases, talk about anatomy and how to evaluate these injuries, general treatment strategies, and then head, neck, and shaft fractures, and then go back to the cases at the end. So I'm going to try Nearpod if people can either open up the app or go on to the website. I have a couple of cases just to kind of pull the audience and start us off. seem to be working. EL3GK. All right, so we'll start with the first case. Can one of the residents give a shot at reading this x-ray, please? Hello? So this is our, it looks like our right-hand x-ray of the AP oblique and lateral. And it looks like for the fifth metacarpal, there's kind of a either high shaft, um, maybe like 20, 30 degrees angulated uh, fracture of the fifth metacarpal. Yeah, good. Um, I measured a little more angulation than that. I measured 50, but um, as you'll hear, that's not obviously, um, that's uh, the inter-reader reliability is not great. So here's the first question. Um, this is a 48 year old male, punched a wall after an argument, he suffered that fracture. His right-hand dominant works as a general chemistry professor at Rutgers, no rotational deformity per the ED. You get called at 11 p.m. You're on St. Peter's call. Um, you have to decide whether you go in and see this, reduce it, or tell them to splint it and follow up. So um, several options. Uh, the first three, tell the ED to either apply an ulnar gutter, buddy tape the ring in small fingers, buddy tape plus a removable wrist brace, um, the next, you drive into St. Peter's or bike if you're Jomar, you close reduce it, and you buddy tape it, close reduce it, buddy tape it, wrist brace, AP slabs, and ulnar gutter. Yeah, the code is PL3GK. Okay, so most common, about 28% of people are doing closed reduction on our gutter. Next most common is AP slabs. Did have 14% uh, until the ED to buddy tape, put in a wrist splint. 6% uh, buddy tape, close reduce. Okay, cool. So the majority of people are going in to close reduce this. Some others are just telling the ED to follow up. Next case. So this is a similar fracture, um, kind of a distal shaft, uh, fifth or small finger metacarpal fracture. This is a 28 year old male, shows up to your office three weeks after sustaining this fracture, after punching a concrete wall. He has roughly 55 degrees of apex dorsal angulation. He's right hand dominant. He's still swollen, has a stiff hand with no rotational deformity and he's neurovascularly intact. 
Would you, A, do nothing and allow mobilization is tolerated, B, no reduction in continuum mobilization, C, attempt to close reduction and mobilize in the office, D and E are CRPP, F is using an intermedullary headless compression screw, and G is ORF with plate and screws. Can you repeat that code again? Yes, PL3GK. It's on the slides where the uh, x-rays are. These are the films when he shows up in your office. Yeah. <laughs> the story was he punched a concrete wall on vacation in the Dominican Republic. Okay, so 26% are saying attempt to close reduction and mobilize. We have 13% saying a headless compression screw. 13% saying allow mobilization is tolerated. And then 13% for different forms of CRPP. The majority are saying attempt to close reduction. Case three. This is a PA oblique and lateral of a transverse mid shaft fourth metacarpal fracture. This is a 35 year old male who showed up to your office five days after sustaining this fracture in a hockey fight. He's right hand dominant. His prominence over the ring finger dorsally is neurovascularly intact, no rotational deformity. Similar options um, do nothing, allow mobilization, close, reduce, mobilize, CRPP. Headless compression screw and ORAF with plate and screws. It's the fracture again. So a couple for headless compression screws, a couple for immobilize, a couple for allow motion is tolerated without doing anything. Five days. Yep. CRPP with intramedullary. Good. Okay. So kind of all over the place too here. Case four, this is uh, and series showing second through fourth metacarpal shaft fractures. Uh, the second is kind of a short oblique. The third is um, the long fingers, more of kind of a base fracture, um, proximal shaft fracture, and the ring finger is kind of a long oblique. So 64 year old male, one month after sustaining closed second through fourth metacarpal shaft fractures after falling down the stairs, um, he had been seen in the office previously and attempted um, non-operative treatment, but is still painful with motion at the fracture site, no rotational deformity and no vascular intact. So options here, continue non-op management at one month, CRPP, ORAF, headless compression screws, or a combination. Uh, good combination, CRPP. One for continued non-operative management. All right. For the next one, we'll just go through briefly. Uh, as a 14-year-old male uh, presented to ED after a fall, he had this fourth uh, ring finger metacarpal shaft fracture. Uh, as well as a small finger metacarpal, proximal metacarpal shaft base fracture uh, with 60 degrees of angulation in the ring finger and 30 degrees in the small finger. He was initially closed reduced and placed into AP slabs. So the options here, and I'll just kind of go through these quickly, um, remove the splint and allow motion is tolerated, continue splint, remove it and put into a fiberglass cast or fix it operatively. 
Yep. So here's a reduction. Good. So most people are saying operative fixation. So he never showed up. Um, he presented to the office a month later um, with these uh, images showing some callus, um, but uh, continued angulation of these fractures. Uh, he has a deformity on his ring finger and small finger, uh, lacks about 30 degrees of terminal extension with no rotational deformity. He can make a fist, but he has weakness to grip strength. Um, so given that most people, actually everyone shows operative management, um, I assume that A is not an option. We'll see, ORIF of fourth and fifth. But why is A not an option? Well, A is absolutely an option, but no one picked it uh, initially. Why not, but, but he, the guy decided not to have surgery. So that's fair. That's probably a bad candidate to operate on. Point taken. All right. So most people are saying ORAF. This last case, um, we'll just go through it so I can get get to the meat of the talk. Um, bicyclist struck with third through fifth metacarpal fractures. Nerve vascularly intact, closed, reduced, and splinted by the on-call APN. Options, CRPP, RAF, X-Fix, and a combo. Good. So some people are saying RAF, some CRPP, some a combination of the two. All right, we'll go back to these at the end and kind of see what we did and um, answer any questions if anyone has, has them. So just a brief introduction to metacarpal fractures. They account for roughly 40% of all hand injuries. Uh, the highest incidence is seen in men in ages 10 to 29. And the so-called boxer's fracture of the small finger metacarpal neck is the most common. Uh, these are generally injuries as a result of a direct blow to the hand or rotational injury with an axial load. Higher energy mechanisms are associated with multiple fractures. Uh, classification, uh, like most fractures, uh, is determined by the, the location and the type of fracture. You can have metacarpal head, neck, shaft, and base fractures. You can be open and close, open versus closed, intra versus extra articular, transverse, oblique, or comminuted. Metacarpal fractures can be associated with a number of other injuries. They can be open with or without significant soft tissue injuries. They can be tendon and nerve injuries. Uh, higher energy mechanisms, you have to worry about compartment syndrome, although it's rare. Uh, the so-called fight bite occurs when a bite penetrates the capsule of the MCP joint in a flexed position. Bacteria can then be trapped within the joint as the fist is released from its clench position um, so that the bacteria is caught under the extensor tendon and or the capsule. These can often be polymicrobial um, with alpha, alpha hemolytic strep, staph aureus, or eichinella, and often necessitate surgical debridement and antibiotics. As with any hand injury, an understanding of the anatomy is integral to appropriately diagnosing and treating metacarpal fractures. They have a unique bony structure. They're concave on the palmar surface. They articulate with the proximal phalanx distally in the carpus proximally. They have a cam-shaped head that forms a condyloid joint with the proximal phalanx. The thumb, ring, and small fingers form mobile borders. Uh, the ring and small fingers have about a 15 to 25 degree flexion extension arc at the CMC joint. Um, thumb metacarpal articulates with the trapezium and acts independently. The index and long finger um, form a stiff central pillar. Uh, the index metacarpal is most firmly flexed and the CMC joints are stable with little motion and that impacts how much angulation you can accept when uh, treating these injuries. The ligamentous anatomy, the collateral ligaments are important for MP joint motion uh, and extension. They're lax and they can deviate more radially and ulnarly. Inflection, uh, the collaterals are under tension, which stabilizes the MP joint, and improves key pinch and grip strength. The volar plate resists hyperextension, and then the inner metacarpal ligament uh, stabilizes the fingers and prevents shortening with these injuries. Number of muscles attached to the metacarpals. The inner ossei originate on the metacarpals and insert into the extensor expansion and proximal phalanx. Um, there's four 
dabs, dorsal uh, interossei that do abduction, and three pads, palmar interossei that do adduction. Uh, the ECRL inserts at the base of the finger, uh, index finger metacarpal. ECRB is right next to that in the base of the long finger metacarpal. ECU and FCU insert at the base of the small finger metacarpal, and FCR inserts at the base of the index finger metacarpal. The ring finger is the only uh, finger with no proximal tendon attachment. This is just a netter's example showing the muscle origins and insertions of the hand. So as a precursor to the talk, just some anatomy uh, useful when evaluating these injuries. Um, shortening, uh, biomechanical studies have shown that two millimeters of shortening can result in a seven degree extensor lag. The MP joints can naturally hyperextend by about 20 degrees. So up to six millimeters may be tolerable uh, with neutral MP extension. Generally, we talk about splinting in the so-called intrinsic plus position of wrist extension and MP flexion. This neutralizes the potentially deforming forces of the intrinsic muscles and prevents loss of MP joint flexion due to contracture of the collateral ligaments in flexion. Pseudoclawing is a, a phenomenon uh, where you have compensatory hyperextension of the MP joint and flexion of the PIP joint that can occur with excessive apex dorsal angulation. And this um, uh, picture up in the top right kind of shows an example of that. Malrotation is extremely important when evaluating these injuries. Each degree of rotation at the metacarpal uh, results in five degrees rotation at the fingertip, which translates to about one and a half centimeters of digital overlap in the closed fist. Complete evaluation of metacarpal fractures includes a thorough exam and appropriate imaging. As always, it starts with inspection, careful inspection for open wounds, tendon lacerations, swelling, and loss of a knuckle contour are important. Um, the location of the deformity may indicate where the injury is. Deformity at the metacarpal base may indicate a CMC dislocation. Shortening of a digit may be evident clinically, but is more likely to be noticed on x-ray. Assessing malrotation um, is of particular importance. As I mentioned, on flexion of the digits, all the fingers should be pointing towards the volar scaphoid tubercle. Um, this can be assessed by the tenodesis effect or having the patient make a fist. Overlap of the digits can be normal in some patients, so it's extremely important when possible to compare to the contralateral hand. As with any fracture, bony point tenderness should be a clue to location of injury. Uh, motor exam should assess, assess the integrity of the tendons and look for any extensor lag that may be present. A neurovascular exam is also key, especially in the case of open fractures. Standard x-ray imaging of the hand is usually enough to diagnose these injuries. Uh, these include a PA, oblique, and lateral images. Several special x-ray views should also be considered. A pronated oblique view can give a better look at the index and long finger CMC joint, or as a supinated oblique view can give a better look at the ring finger and small finger CMC joint. The Brewerton view may be used in the case of metacarpal head fractures and will be discussed later. And a Roberts view gives you a true AP of the thumb. These are examples of how to obtain the Roberts view, um, where you pronate the hand with the dorsum of the thumb lying on the cassette. On the right, you see examples of how to obtain the pronated and supinated oblique views of the hand. These are particularly important for the residents to be aware of uh, when seeing these injuries in the ED. Oftentimes, you'll have to go with the patient to the x-ray room, and you should know how to get these images to look at those joints. Advanced imaging is rarely needed in the diagnosis of these injuries, but CT scan can be useful in the case of inconclusive x-rays for CMC fracture dislocations, multiple CMC dislocations, or complex intraarticular fractures. So we'll go into specific treatments for the different types, but there's a kind of a general treatment algorithm. Um, generally, uh, metacarpal fractures that are stable with no rotational deformity and acceptable angulation and shorting may be, may be treated non-operatively. Operative indications in most cases are malrotation, open fractures, displaced intraarticular fractures, unacceptable deformity, or multiple fractures. On the right, uh, this is just a table taken from a recent review article um, with kind of their suggested overarching guidelines for the treatment of these fractures. Um, as we'll talk about, the accepted angulation and shortening um, is not always agreed upon. The goal with any treatment of these fractures uh, is stable fixation, early motion, and minimal soft tissue stripping. Um, there's a lot of different operative uh, fixation techniques, um, and we'll go over them um, kind of one by one here. <clears throat> so we'll start with metacarpal head fractures and just discuss them briefly. They're rare, uh, usually, intra, usually intraarticular injuries. Um, index finger is most commonly involved because of its relative immobility of the CMC joint. 
Uh, the small finger is less likely to be involved, even that it has increased mobility and allows flexion so that a, an axial load um, is more likely to produce a neck fracture. And the thumb metacarpal head fractures are also rare as usually the energy dissipates at the proximal metaphysis or CMC joint. This is how you obtain a Brewerton view, uh, which I briefly mentioned earlier. Uh, this can be useful in identifying and characterizing metacarpal head fractures. Uh, it's obtained by flexing the MP joint to 65 degrees with the dorsum of fingers lying flat on the x-ray plate and the tube angled 15 degrees in an ulnar to radial direction. The example on the right shows a subtle fracture of the third metacarpal head on the ulnar side there. This is one of the, the bigger studies I could find about intraarticular metacarpal head fractures by McElfresh and Dobbins reported uh, 103 intraarticular metacarpal head fractures in 100 patients. They characterized the fractures by type, and found that there's a wide variety of fracture types with the most common being comminuted, ligament avulsions and oblique fractures. Most of these fractures occurred in the 10 to 29 age range. Roughly 20% of the injuries were open and they were treated with a wide variety of techniques, which we'll briefly kind of go over now. So the general principles of treating metacarpal head fractures are similar to any intraarticular fracture. Each fracture should be uniquely assessed. Large intraarticular pieces should be reconstructed if possible. And the aim is for early mobilization to prevent stiffness. As with any injury, there are non-operative and operative treatment strategies. Non-operative treatment of metacarpal head fractures should be limited to non-displaced or minimally displaced fractures with little to no articular step off. These should be treated with a short period of immobilization. Operative options include ORIF, external fixator, MP arthroplasty, and MP fusion. Uh, the most common complication of the metacarpal head fractures is stiffness, as you might expect given the intraarticular nature, uh, which can be due to a variety of reasons. So ORIF is generally indicated for non-comminuted fractures uh, that do not meet operative criteria. Um, some of the quoted numbers are displaced fracture more than 25% of the surface or more than one millimeter of step off. They can be approached through the dorsal approach and usually can be fixed with either headless screws or K wires followed by immobilization. External fixation is a good option for comminuted fractures, particularly in presence of associated phalanx fractures. They should also be considered with open fractures that may need surgical debridement or if there's a high concern for initial contamination. Metacarpal arthroplasty can be considered in open fractures and particularly in comminuted fractures with significant bone loss. General contraindications are fractures of the index metacarpal, inadequate soft tissue coverage, or extreme bone loss. While these procedures can be successful in the appropriate situation, they do have a high complication rate, including late failure, delayed infection, implant fracture, synovitis, and stiffness. MP arthrodesis is an option, but really it's only a salvage procedure. Next, we'll move into metacarpal neck fractures. These most commonly occur in the ring and small fingers, um, with the small finger metacarpal being the most common. Usual mechanism is patients who hit solid objects so that the clenched metacarpal phalangeal joint hits the object and produces apex dorsal angulation. This dorsal angulation is generally the result of impact of the dorsum of the metacarpal head that results in comminution of the volar metacarpal neck. The intrinsic muscles crossing the uh, MP joint lie volar to the axis of rotation and flex the metacarpal head. Indications for non-operative management include acceptable angulation without rotational malalignment. Uh, given the lack of CMC motion at the index and long finger metacarpals, more than about five to 10 to 15 degrees is commonly cited as the cutoff for non-operative treatment. Increasing angulation is better tolerated in the ring and small fingers and is commonly reported as 30 to 40 degrees in the ring and 50 to 60 degrees in small finger. However, there are several studies that report um, good functional outcomes in fractures with up to 70 degrees of acceptable angulation for fifth metacarpal neck fractures. Many of these numbers were initially, many of these uh, first numbers were initially based off of biomechanical studies. Um, and as I briefly mentioned before, inter-reader reliability is shown to be somewhat poor and is dependent upon uh, the X-ray angle. Techniques for non-operative management vary among practitioners. Some studies advocate no reduction, uh, depending on the amount of angulation. Other studies discuss pointing in flexion versus extension. Uh, more studies advocate for buddy taping with a soft wrap and early motion. Um, ultimately, though, general non-operative management of these injuries consists of a short period of mobilization followed by early range of motion. There are several techniques uh, for closed reduction. There's the Joss maneuver. Um, there's the modified Joss maneuver. 
Um, basically, what these, uh, how these are accomplished is a volarly applied force through the dorsal aspect of the metacarpal, and then a counter force along the proximal phalanx that allows reduction of the apex dorsal fracture. Uh, splinting uh, is generally recommended in the intrinsic plus position, uh, where the wrist is in 30 degrees of extension and the MP joints are flexed to 70 to 90 degrees with the IP joints extended, um, although several studies have shown that functional outcomes are no different um, when splinting in extension versus flexion at the MP joint. This is that study um, in 2005 out of JBJS. It was a retrospective study. Uh, 260 patients in three groups were immobilized for five weeks. They were all extra articular metacarpal fractures. Um, they, the fractures in this study were closed reduced and then the acceptable angulation um, was for the shaft, um, index and long fingers 10 degrees, ring finger 20 degrees, small finger 30 degrees, and neck it was 15, 15, 30, and 50 to 60. So there are three groups. Group one was the uh, MP joints in flexion with full IP motion. Group two was MP joints in extension um, and IP in extension with no IP motion allowed. Group three was the MP joints in flexion with no IP motion. X-rays and range of motion were evaluated at five weeks and range of motion and grip strength were evaluated at nine weeks. The results showed no significant difference between any of the five, any of the three groups at five weeks for either range of motion or maintenance of reduction. And there was no significant difference at nine weeks for range of motion or grip strength. This is another study that uh, compared buddy taping uh, to plaster mobilization. It's out of emergency medicine um, literature. Uh, there's a randomized control trial in patients with an isolated uh, small finger metacarpal neck fracture. Uh, inclusion criteria include closed uh, fractures with an angulation of less than 70 degrees. Uh, these were all just fifth metacarpal neck fractures. Two groups, uh, 97 patients. Uh, first group was just buddy taping of the small, uh, the ring and little fingers and versus plaster casting. They similarly showed no significant difference uh, in quick dash scores at 12 weeks or time off work, pain, satisfaction, or an overall health score at three, six, and 12 weeks. This is another study, uh, randomized control trial with similar inclusion criteria for small finger metacarpal neck fractures. Two groups, um, 68 patients. Uh, they compared buddy taping in a soft wrap, wrap without a reduction to closed reduction in casting um, with uh, an extension cast, which was just the, the preference of the uh, treating team. Um, they similarly showed similar outcomes with DASH scores, pain, and satisfaction. Uh, with, no immediate, with no functional impact of immediate mobilization at four months. However, it's important to note that um, if you're gonna try this technique with significantly angulated fractures that the patients need to be warned um, that they may lose their knuckle contour. They didn't really, um, but yeah, I, I don't think they did too much stratification for that. This was a systematic review of the literature looking at cutoff for acceptable angulation. Um, as I mentioned before, the kind of the dogma was that um, significant biomechanical impact uh, occurred around 30 degrees of angulation for a fifth metacarpal neck fracture. Um, however, they didn't account for compensatory mechanisms of the hand, so there was little value clinically as the argument of this author. Uh, I looked at 18 articles um, and really found that up to 90% of fractures with up to 70 degrees of angulation can be treated conservatively with no reduction. Um, however, reducing it does improve the aesthetic look of the hand. So we talked about non-op treatment of these fractures. How about operative treatment? Uh, indications are unacceptable angulation, which obviously depends on the scenario, any rotational malalignment, open fracture, or pseudo clawing of the hand. Um, one of the most common techniques, techniques is closed reduction and percutaneous pinning. There's a number of different pinning techniques. Uh, you can cross pin, uh, which is shown on the top right, either anti-grade or retrograde. The bottom left image shows something called bouquet osteosynthesis, where you um, put wires up through, uh, anti-grade through the base of the uh, metacarpal and transverse pinning, where you pin uh, across to an adjacent metacarpal. ORIF is always an option. Um, specifically, if you can't get the reduction closed, you can still pin even if you do an open reduction. Um, tension band wiring has been described and mini condylar plates do exist. Although these um, occasionally have limited utility uh, depending on how distal the fracture is. Headless compression screws have become more common in the last decade and we'll talk a little bit more about those later. 
And then postoperatively, usually you're immobilizing these for two to three weeks um, and starting range of motion exercises. Complications of these injuries include loss of the knuckle contour, diminished range of motion, palpable metacarpal head in the palm, uh, rotational malalignment, non and malunion, um, which are rare, but do occur, and pseudo clawing, which I mentioned before, where you have this compensatory hyperextension of the MP joint and flexion of the PIP joint. So we'll go talk about metacarpal shaft fractures. Um, these are classified by fracture pattern. Uh, they can be transverse, they can be oblique or spiral, and they can be comminuted. Um, thumb metacarpal shafts um, generally occur uh, at the proximal metaphyseal diaphyseal junction are considered epibasal. Usually they're apex dorsal with the distal fragment adducted and flexed. Um, to get a true lateral of the thumb, uh, you can try to get the MP sesamoids superimposed on each other. Um, and generally quoted guidelines for non-operative management of thumb metacarpal fractures is about 30 degrees of angulation. So for non-operative treatment indications, uh, similarly, there's kind of uh, general guidelines about acceptable angulation and shortening. Um, really any amount of malrotation is an operative indication and techniques uh, like we discussed with metacarpal neck fractures include close reduction and mobilization and multiple immobilization techniques have been described. Um, this is just a table out of ortho bullets, um, kind of describing the general uh, range of acceptable angulation for these fractures, which is less in the shaft than it is in the neck. So operative treatment indications, uh, generally multiple fractures, open fractures, bone loss or significant soft tissue injuries, any polytrauma patients, or any patients that are unable to tolerate cast mobilization. Techniques can be closed reduction, percutaneous pinning, intramedullary pin, intramedullary screw, um, open reduction via a number of techniques in external fixation. This is a busy slide, but it's taken out of greens and kind of highlights the multitude of options to consider when fixing these fractures. Um, the number of different techniques make it difficult to study and have high level studies comparing each um, because there are so many variable, variables. K wires are very useful and can treat almost any type of metacarpal fracture. Um, you can have intramedullary devices, which are generally used for more transverse fractures. Interfrag fixation uh, is an option in long oblique and spiral fractures. ORF with plates and screws are often used for multiple fractures to give it rigid uh, fixation. And X fix is always an option for significant bone loss, concern for infection or adjacent uh, phalanx fractures. So this is just a meta-analysis meta um, done recently, highlighting the kind of difficulty of drawing conclusions from studies comparing the different fixation types for metacarpal fractures. There are many papers comparing one or two techniques, um, but unfortunately many of them are somewhat low quality, which makes it difficult to draw conclusions. Uh, in this meta-analysis, nine studies were concluded that compared CRPP to ORIF, and the results showed no real significant difference in long-term dash score, MP range of motion, grip strength, complication rates, or pain scores. Uh, CRPP was comparatively higher shortening on x-ray compared to ORF in this study. This is just a table um, kind of highlighting the studies a little more in depth, bearing the complications of the pin group versus the plate group, and then residual angulation of each. Complications of metacarpal shaft fractures, similar to neck fractures. Uh, you can have dorsal angulation um, where there's uh, metacarpal head prominence in the palm. You can get pseudo clawing. You can get dorsal prominence uh, on the metacarpal shaft, which can be aesthetically displeasing and you can get weakness. Uh, shortening, as I said, is, is always a concern. Malrotation, stiffness, hardware removal, infection. Um, rates are low, but do occur about 1% uh, and non-union, uh, which some studies define as no clinical or radiographic healing four months after fixation or radiographic fracture line at 14 months, um, which is more common in transverse fractures. So I'll just highlight a couple studies, a couple of recent studies that I found. Um, this was a recent study out of orthopedics that discussed the complication rate of low profile anatomic plates. Historically, ORIF, had a, ORIF with plates and screws had a roughly 35% complication rate in metacarpal fractures. This study was a retrospective chart review of 79 patients with 110 metacarpal fractures treated with low-profile plates. They only showed a 10% complication rate with a roughly 1% reoperation rate, showing that potentially these new lower-profile plates are much better tolerated than the older plates. 
Uh, of recent growing interest in the hand community is the use of intramedullary headless compression screws for metacarpal fractures. First case report was described in 2010 and has become an increasingly popular choice for metacarpal fracture management. As reported, benefits include early range of motion, lower incidence of hardware removal, and less soft tissue stripping than plate and screw fixation. This is a recent biomechanical study comparing dorsal plating, lag screws, and headless compression screws. They took five match paired hands and used non-thumb metacarpals. Headless compression screws were 3.5 millimeters in the small and ring fingers and 4.0 in the index and long fingers. They tested transverse diaphyseal fractures and long oblique fractures. For the plates, they used 2.4 millimeter low profile plates and screws were 2.4 millimeter cortical screws. Results of this study showed increased stiffness and in peak load to failure in transverse fractures and increased peak load to failure uh, in long oblique fractures. This was a recent meta-analysis in 2019 um, that looked at nine articles uh, describing intramedullary headless compression screws. Uh, 70 uh, there were a total of 169 metacarpal fractures. 74% of them involved the small finger. 66 were neck fractures. 31 were shaft fractures. And 10 were head fractures. Mean follow-up was 11 months. Uh, there was a 100% radiographic union with good MP flexion and total active motion. There were only nine reported complications, including four cases of hardware removal. The authors therefore conclude that this is a safe and effective option for metacarpal fractures that has shown good outcomes. Uh, these results certainly sound promising, um, but some people warn that it may be too early to tell the appropriate indications for this technique. Uh, there was a couple comments to this paper um, published in the same journal. Um, the first acknowledges that intramedullary nailing is not a new concept and that utilizing headless compression screws is a logical choice and makes sense for some metacarpal frac shaft fractures. However, the, in, the um, evidence is limited in especially in that uh, meta-analysis to case reports and case series. Uh, in, other, in one of the articles, there was only two week follow-up and three others, there was six weeks or less. So there's a question uh, additionally of how much rotational stability these offer. Um, do they back out over time? What happens uh, if you have to remove them after, or if you refracture them in a patient population that is prone to refracture? Ultimately, specific indications and long-term safety, safety need to be determined. This is another comment um, that argues that it's hard to really draw comparisons to traditional methods um, that have proven to be very successful in treating these injuries, um, given that there's a short-term follow-up with no long-term data on the effect of the MP joint. Um, they should be, they argue that it should be avoided in comminuted fractures due to possible shortening in osteoporosis or RA. Regardless, headless compression screws are a promising option for treating metacarpal fractures and have good early data. Longer term follow-up and prospective studies are needed to further elucidate the indications for this technique. So the last study I'm going to review um, was an interesting study out of the plastic surgery hand world uh, that looked at recent trends in operative metacarpal fractures, I think is a good way to capture some of the general trends and how we've been managing these fractures. So the American Board of Plastic Surgery um, reported uh, or have surgeons report on 10 consecutive cases with that on patient medical history, preoperative physical exam, operative details and surgical outcomes are all recorded. The data for medical carpal fracture repair reviewed um, from was from 2006 to 2020. They were separated into two groups, 2006 to 2014 and 2015 to 2020. There were 1,160 total cases. 87% of them were closed. 48% were shaft fractures. 24% were neck fractures, with the small finger being most common, followed by the ring finger. Um, there was a pretty good range of transverse, oblique, and comminuted fractures. 34% of these, and these were all operative, um, had a rotational deformity with 20% having multiple metacarpal fractures. And there was about 85% patient satisfaction as well as surgeon satisfaction. Anesthesia, uh, general anesthesia was used in the majority of these cases. Um, local only was it used in about 7%, local plus sedation in about three to 4%. Regional sedation, uh, with like a um, brachial plexus block was 14% to 9% and then beer block was about one to two percent. Techniques uh, were closed reduction and splinting about 10 percent of the time, CRPP about a quarter of the time, X-fix was rare, and then ORAF um, was done about half the time. Plates were the most common, followed by lag screws. Um, perioperative antibiotics were also recorded. Um, in about 22 percent of these cases, no perioperative antibiotics were documented. Um, one dose was given in about two-thirds, and then more than one in about 10 percent. Um, 
inpatient uh, management of these fractures occurred about 15 to 20% of the time, hospital outpatient about half the time, and then freestanding outpatient center about a quarter of the time. The incision to dressing time was about 51 minutes and the tourniquet was used in about two thirds of cases. Adverse events as uh, many have previously reported were uh, low infection, non-union and malunion rates were all about 1%. Uh, the most common adverse event being decreased MP motion and about 2% of the time, the hardware had to be removed. So for completely sake, I'll just touch upon metacarpal base fractures um, that are outside, really kind of outside the scope of this talk, um, but stable minimally displaced fractures can be treated conservatively. Uh, it's important to get appropriate imaging at the time of injury, oblique views, and consider a CT scan, and you need to have high index of concern for a CMC dislocation. This was an x-ray done about a week and a half ago of a patient, Robert Wood, that was read as just an isolated ring finger metacarpal shaft fracture and did not mention the small finger CMC dislocation. Uh, so it's important to look at the, uh, the imaging very closely. And as a reminder, this is how to obtain a Roberts view and the supinated and pronated oblique. So we'll just go quickly back through the cases here. Case one was this fifth metacarpal kind of distal shaft neck fracture. We had a kind of a wide variety of what people would do. I think most people said they would go in and try to reduce it and put it in some sort of um, immobilization. Uh, that's what I did. I chose AP slabs. Um, sometimes I do an ulnar gutter. It's kind of just how I'm, how I'm feeling. Um, got a decent reduction. Uh, Pre-reduction was about 50 degrees and post-reduction 20 degrees. Second case, um, this was a similar fracture, showed up three weeks. Um, out from his injury, it had a swollen stiff hand. Uh, and this was one that was fixed with an intramedullary headless compression screw. So these are just interop fluoros showing the guide wire and then final fluoro showing the screw. These are clinical gross photos, top left showing uh, kind of the deformity pre-op um, and then inserting the screw and then post-operatively uh, in the small incision. It took about 11 minutes of tourniquet time. Case three, so this was the isolated ring finger metacarpal shaft fracture um, in the hockey player. Um, this one was treated with intramedullary pinning. These are fractures um, a couple weeks out. Um, the pin was removed. This is two months later showing good callus formation. Um, he had excellent motion at this time. And then these are most recent images um, where he's allowed to return back to contact. So why on case two and three did the patient need surgery? Like case three, what was the issue on case three? You have pretty good alignment, not terrible angulation, no rotational problem. Why wasn't that just splinted? Yeah, I mean, that, that can certainly be an option. Um, um, so you what, know, do you tell the, what do you tell the patient? You're going to have the same result, but you should have a pin placed or screw placed? Well, I'm, you can tell them that, that uh, non-operative management is a good option in this, um, in this injury. Uh, however, you do run a higher risk of having kind of a bump on your finger. Um, there's a chance that it could continue or that reduction could not be maintained conservatively uh, and that you're, you're more likely to achieve less angulation if you fix it. And if you catch it early enough and they want it done so that they don't have a bump on their finger for sure, then it's reasonable, I think, to fix it. Um, how long does it take that very transverse, minimally commented middle of the diaphysis fracture to heal normally? To heal completely, but, it, I mean, it, it can take months. I mean, it can take a long time. They have the transverse fractures have the highest rate of non-union too. So that would, yeah, you can sit by and watch those heal forever. Yeah. And a guy that's breathing down your neck saying, when can I play hockey? When can I play hockey? I think the relative risk of putting a percutaneous pin in, in that guy. And the reason that I would do it for that guy is to try and, you know, have him heal kind of on time. You're not going to get him to heal any faster necessarily. Right. 
but have him in a good position, have him heal on time, gives him the best chance of not having to go through the next phase of what do we do if it's not healed? What do we do? We don't see any callus. So, you know, it's, it's minimal risk. And I think it, you know, gives a better patient outcome. So that's why he got it. Yeah. This was the fourth case, um, second through fourth metacarpal fractures, um, kind of failed non-operative management, um, at least at a month, and then was ultimately taken for ORIF with plates and screws. Um, I believe the initial thought going into the OR was try for close reduction percutaneous pinning, but it was unable to um, get it reduced. I think they started with the index metacarpal uh, fixed that, and then there was some shortening of the long and ring fingers, so they decided to plate, plate them all while they were there. So the indication for surgery was pain at four weeks? Yeah. So is, is that a new indication? Pain at four weeks? No, no. Um, I, you know, I certainly an, op an option would be to continue non-operative management um, to get it to heal. Uh, I think at that point, the patient was frustrated with the lack of progress and just wanted to get fixations so that he could have functional use of his hand sooner. So you're telling me in a short arm splint, he couldn't use his hand, but now with these plates on, he has no splint and he's now perfect. No, not at all. I mean, he was certainly stiff for a little while, um, but he, he did not have a splint on for, you know, I think he was splinted until his first, uh, first week, one week follow up, and then it was removed. You can make a case for anything, and you can yeah. certainly make a case as multiple metacarpals, but if yeah. you decide on day one, which I think is appropriate, to treat it in a splint, to expect everything to be healed, pain free, and perfect at four weeks is, is uh, doesn't make any sense. So if you're treating it, you know, give it a little bit longer. If you decide you want to fix it, you can make a case as three metacarpals. But a 64 year old person, I mean, another few weeks and the guy would be fine with the same result. You already told us the result's the same no matter what you do. Yep. Yeah, I, I'd have fixed that guy right out of the gate probably. But, you know, again, if you go down that road, I agree with David, you know, follow that course to a reasonable conclusion before you jump the shark. Yeah. This was the fifth case, um, showed up in the office at one month. Um, yeah, still had a splint on, um, was taken for a takedown of the malunion and RIF with plate and screw construct in the ring and small finger. Uh, this was one month post-op uh, x-ray showing maintained alignment and in intact hardware. He had full range of motion per the note uh, without any pain. So you did this for a bump, right? Say again? It, it was healed. You, saw, you showed an x-ray with callus. It was Correct. definitely not aligned properly. Correct. This was more of an no, aesthetic. Did he have any functional problem or was it just he didn't like the bump? Um, he, he did have some stiffness per the note. Um, he had but, an extensor lag. This and, is my yeah, case. I'm sorry. 30 degrees of extensor lag. Okay. Would you expect a 30 degree extensor lag? In a, an angulated fracture, 60 degrees? Yeah, yeah, you would. Yeah. Why? Because, I mean, well, you have kind of a pseudo clawing um, deformity so that you lose extension. Because the, right, the you know, do most MP joints hyperextend? Yeah, 20 degrees. Okay. So we already know, you already told us that you can accept. 30 degrees at least in the ring finger of a shed right. fracture and the patient's going to be fine. So this is 40, 45 degrees. I, I measured at 60 degrees, but I yeah. measured at 60 also. And a 14 year old kid with, you know, a 30 degree extensor lag, I think it's reasonable uh, to I, fix it. It's, it's definitely reasonable, but but you already have a case where it's healed. He's going to get, you're right. You're going to gain a little bit of extension, but is, is it going to be a big functional difference? Why didn't the kid want to have the surgery right away? I think there he was, some, he was four weeks yeah, out. He, no, I understand he had that, but, seen by another doctor and they didn't treat him. He was in no splint when he came to see me. So he had been trying to move his hand. 
Um, and even by the time I got him to the OR, it was another two weeks. He still had that extensor lag. So he wanted the surgery so he can open his hand up all the way. I mean, he also didn't like the bump. I, I'm, we don't have to discount that. I mean, and I think that in this day and age, there's something to be said for cosmesis. You know, I think sitting there and saying it's just for cosmesis, I think it's a different time now and people are less willing to accept cosmesis problems. But that is not why we did this. We did this for his extensor leg and a 14 year old boy. That, that's a big deal. And I mean, within one week, he had full extension. Okay. I'm not, this is, I think is the right thing to do. I just want to make sure that, you know, because some of the cases clearly he's met the criteria for fixing it. But I always look at both sides. Yeah. So I, I think it's very reasonable, but just look at both sides. He, he, it's not a bad hand, but you're absolutely correct. For function, it's better. And for the bump, it's better. You yeah, know, I, I don't know I don't... about, go ahead. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, all right, I was just gonna, my comment was, I think that I would have done the same thing on the fourth metacarpal. Um, I don't know if I would have used a plate or an intramedullary yeah, screw, that help. is debatable. But my question is, why did you go ahead and fix the fifth metacarpal? That looked to be four weeks out and not too displaced. So, I mean, for me personally, when I was in there, I made my incision right in between the two. Um, I thought it looked more displaced when I was looking at it and I was already looking at it. I didn't think it was that much harder to fix. He was already under anesthesia. Um, I wasn't sure he wasn't extending a small finger all the way either, but I just wasn't sure if that's because his ring finger wasn't extending all the way and he just had tethering. So I didn't want to get back post-op and say, oh crap, your, your small finger is angulated too. Cause that's a base fracture. So you can't get away with a ton of angulation at the base. You lose that advantage of mobility. So since I was right there, I mean, it was more of a ease and not wanting to have to go back if I was wrong. I, I think you could make an argument that you don't need to fix it. He was consented for both. I talked with the residents that I wasn't sure what I was going to do up until the operating room time. But I think that would be reasonable to not fix either. Was there anything wrong with his thumb? Nope. No. So that middle view is the normal appearance of the CMC joint? I mean, it doesn't look it, but he had no thumb pain and he had sure. no mobility problems. But I mean, I don't, you know, that's like kind of a quasi weird oblique view. It's not meant to be a thumb view. Yeah. Dr. Butler noticed the same thing, but. I mean, some you know, people the, have the seen point that, I was that look make... a little sublux. I guess you could actually the other side if, if you were curious about it, but he's asymptomatic. So I don't think that it really matters. I think the. Uh... I don't know about everybody else, but I'm seeing a kind of a rash of people that have been treated in these med emerges where they think they can just sort of handle it and they don't come to your attention until they're like four, six, eight weeks out. And they've kind of been, you know, a mismanage is maybe too strong a word. I mean, it's as we've talked about, there's, you can skin this cat in a hundred different ways, but now they've kind of forced your hand because it's gone a little bit wonkier than you wanted it to. And something that, you know, we would measure at 60 degrees, somebody else is measuring it at 40 degrees, and, or maybe they didn't measure it at all. Um, and I think it makes the, the treatment of some of these a little bit more challenging because of that. Um, I don't know if that's an insurance thing or people just relying on their Medi-Merges, but I'm also seeing patients that use the Medi-Merges as their regular doctor. And I'm like, this, this is sort of a, a world, world, weird world we're living in right now. So anyway, my two cents. This was the last case, 53-year-old um, uh, bicyclist struck by a van with the closed third, fourth, and fifth metacarpal fractures. Uh, he was provisionally splinted by the APN and then taken later that day for uh, CRPP. This was a relatively recent case. He was at uh, uh, three weeks out, still had some swelling and stiffness. And then the plan was to remove the pins about four to six weeks. So just in summary, uh, metacarpal fractures are common injuries of the hand. Uh, evaluation of these injuries must include a thorough physical exam and appropriate imaging. Uh, treatment decisions must account for fracture location and patient characteristics. Uh, Non-op treatment is the mainstay for the majority of these injuries, and many different forms of mobilization are acceptable. Uh, criteria for acceptable angulation varies and should be used as a general guide 
and multiple operative techniques exist and should be tailored based upon each individual fracture, patient characteristics, and surgeon preference. So I just want to thank Dr. Letty, Blika, Coyle, and Monica for their insight in their cases and the remainder of the hand attendings um, for helping me on the hand rotation. These are references. Any questions? I had one a comment, two comments. One is that that was a great review of everything. I just wanted to mention one thing because you quoted an article several times, that article by that you footnoted, Strouch and Rosenwasser. Uh, that was a cadaver study when you talked Correct. about seven degrees for every two millimeters of shortening. Correct. Just want you know the people listening that that's in the cadaver. That's not in real life. So even though it says in a lab it's seven degrees, your body makes up for some of that, which is why you can have shortening of at least six millimeters. And they also showed in that study that if you cut, if you fracture the, a single bone, not multi-trauma, but a single bone, that it almost never shortens more than five to six millimeters. So shortening is almost never an issue with an isolated fracture. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was, that was the often quoted study in a lot of these uh, kind of acceptable angulation guidelines um, that has been shown clinically to be, um, you know, able to accept more. What's the structure that prevents it from shortening more than five or six millimeters? It's an inner metacarpal ligament uh, that really prevents the shortening. Yeah, sometimes that's an in-service or a board question, the deep transverse inner metacarpal ligament. Yeah. Yep. You know, quick comment on my side. I, I there are very few metacarpal fractures that I want to fix that I can't fix with a K wire. Yeah. Um, I know, you know, these other things are nice and they're fancy and they're new and they're typically more expensive, frequently made out of titanium. And I just think that, uh, you know, picking and choosing how you fix it is arguably as important as if you're going to fix it or not. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, a K wire is your friend in a lot of different ways. You could put them in a hundred different ways, intermedullary crossing them, cross pinning across metacarpals. I mean, you showed all of that and you should really kind of think it through before you necessarily drop a plate on one that doesn't really need that. I mean, if you're doing osteotomies and so forth, you're going to need to hold that in a different way. And so I don't have a problem using plates or screws for that matter, but know your patient, know your situation and just don't use screws on every single one of those. Jeremy, quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. It was great uh, review. I guess my question to the hand attendings for the, you mentioned the JBJS article on immobilization of fifth metacarpal neck fractures. Has that made it through to clinical practice yet? So for the hand attendings on, if you have a fifth metacarpal neck that required reduction in the ER and then it gets splinted and then it shows up in your office at seven to 10 days, uh, what is everyone putting them into for their non-operative care? Are we talking all metacarpals or pediatric no, cases? Fifth, what are we talking? No, fifth metacarpal neck that was like 60 or 70 degrees, say it was 70, 80 degrees. It required a reduction in the ER. The residents reduced it nicely, put it in a nice splint, and now it shows up uh, to your office for its kind of long-term care. So is, has this made it to clinical practice yet? Have people gotten rid of the original short arm cast with the MP flex 70 degrees and the IP joints extended? So I, I never put that kind of a cast on. Um, when, where I was training, we always put, we called a Beckenbach cast on, which just rides a little bit high up on the metacarpal you know, head area. So you can't really flex the MCP joint, but we leave the IPs free, but we buddy tape them. And so in one patient, if it's a genuine knucklehead he's getting a cast if it's another patient that just had the i slipped and fell and broke my knuckle kind of a thing um sometimes i'll have the hand therapist make the same thing but it's a fracture brace and buddy taping that's what i like to do anyway uh, for yeah, my I practice mean, if it's, i know if that it's... study shows that you could buddy tape but I, I sometimes i think of it like the the distal radius studies that say like don't even bother reducing them, they'll never stay. But you look at the results here, and I, I don't think that those really fall for distal radius fractures. And I, I personally think that's true for metacarpal fractures here. And after being other places, I could tell you that in, in Pittsburgh, they didn't even try and reduce them or they didn't even, 
or if they did try, it was like a really half-assed try. And then they would be like, oh, well, they don't stay. And it's it's like, well, I mean, why would it ever stay if it's not in a good splint? So I still tend to cast them. I put on the cast that Dr. Letty just said, kind of a high riding short arm and then buddy tape the fingers probably because that's what he taught me to do. Um, and I think it works really well. You just kind of make little indents where you want the pressure to kind of hold it back. Um, but that's me personally. I, I'm not sure I believe that study 100% when it's being well reduced to begin with. If the resident reduces it nicely and it comes to the office and it maintains whatever reduction and the patient wants the best possible alignment, I usually keep it on for three weeks and then they're done. If it settles back down, then they have to decide whether they want to accept the bump or no bump. Most people accept the bump. Sometimes you can re-reduce it. But it's really, if the patient doesn't care what his hand looks like, you could put him in an ACE bandage and let him do what they want. Yeah, uh, Steve, you ask each of us, you're going to get a different answer. But um, I, I, I've had a problem at seven days where I've taken it off and then tried to recast them, especially in flexion. One, because they're painful, because you need to push molarly to kind of hold that reduction. And I've actually lost the reduction with trying to get empty flexion. This study says it doesn't matter. And I think it was Shin's paper uh, from the Mayo group and Tim can correct me, but they had a, a nice series where they did that Beckenbach cast and they did the MP and extension. That's easier to hold the reduction. And that's another way to go. So I was telling the residents, if you are gonna reduce it, I like that Beckenbach way. And like Dave said, leave them in this uh, orthosis for three weeks and then they're probably done. In all honesty, though, if somebody has a markedly displaced fracture, it looks better with the reduction, I'll probably talk to them about surgery. And, and I'm one of those guys that's doing more of those um, intermedullary screws. I've just had great success with it. They move it right away. So I'll certainly talk to them about surgical fixation. Brian, tell, tell us all what the, uh, the cost of that screw is. That's a good question. It's a good question that I don't know, but my gut would be about $700. But I will say, and again, I, I'm not the, you know, there's a lot of things I do that probably could be, you know, cheaper. Um, but I will say, and I've said that this would be one of times them. now, yeah, that one, sometimes when you put pins in, patients are reluctant to move their hands and then they'll need some therapy afterwards. So the increased cost of that screw may be three or four physical therapy visits, which I typically don't have screws doing therapy. I typically have pins do. So this is where big data would be really helpful in looking at the overall cost. Um, and, then, and then pins also have some complications. We, I mean, you look at Lutsky's paper, and I think it was like 30% of patients with uh, pins had complications. Do you leave men? Do you leave them out? Do you give them antibiotics? There's a lot of things that happen there. Um, so it's not cut and dry. It's just what's the cost of the screw. All right. Just, to, just so the residents keep in mind, the K wire costs $3.50. Almost all of them could be out by three weeks, maybe four on a transverse fracture. And almost all of them, I'm talking about neck fractures uh, or shaft fractures, um, almost all of them could be left out of the skin and pulled out in the office. I don't re remember ever sending anyone for therapy because you can move their IP joints right away. But I, I don't know the cost of that screw, but I, I would say you're probably right, 700 to 1,000, but I don't know was a study I came across that, that was in that ballpark. I think it was around there. I'll try to send you the paper. <clears throat> yeah, I, I want to make one other comment because both David and, and uh, Brian had, had touched on it. it and, and it's a problem in my, my particular office. So, you know, sometimes you get a guy that comes in and he's been splinted by, you know, one of the residents and it's like the perfect splint. And it's perfect really to do. So you're looking at the x-ray and you're thinking, oh, this is going to be a chip shot. And you walk in the room and the splint is on the table already and the nurse is taking it off and she's trying to help you move along. And you're like, oh, shit, you know, I was almost there, you know, just needed to leave that splint on. Um, so, yeah, I think when you can do that, that's optimal. If it's already been reduced and it's in a good splint, there's nothing better than that. And um, so I, I try and, you know, you know, jump the shark on those when I can and get in there before the nurse takes the splint off to send them for x-ray. So uh, be, be aware of that because that, that can be a, a great way to manage, you know, a fracture that your best opportunity to reduce it is, you know, the first one, it's in the ER, uh, you, you, you could get a really good reduction because there's not usually a whole lot of swelling. The delayed ones are more difficult, but 
when you can, that's a great way to manage them. Well, thank you, everybody. Nice job, thank good, you. Good job, nice review.